You, you've seen the NVIDIA numbers, right? Yes. Beat uh, on bottom line, also on, on the guide. Stock is up. Yes. Maybe not as much as you would have expected NVIDIA to be up before after a beat, but what do you think? This is a sign of incredibly fast demand growth in compute. And that's a sign of the nonlinear rate of AI improvement. As AI technology just gets better and better, we see a proliferation of use cases, and that means the demand for compute goes up and up and up. It looks to us like systematically the, the demand for compute is going to be far above the ability to supply that demand. All right, so it's uh, sort of like a, I don't know, like Jackson Hole, it's a ski slope. It's, it's almost vertical, exactly. uh, right? Exactly. But here's the thing uh, to power that compute, let's get to <laughs> yes. one of the big themes that you've been thinking and writing a lot about uh, recently, right? Power lags behind. It does. And uh, we were talking offline a couple seconds ago, and I wanted to ask you whether, and I want to get your take on this as well, the competition in AI for the U.S. Is it versus China necessarily, or is it versus say profitability and how does power play into all of this? That is a really important question. It is both. So let's talk about U.S. versus China and then let's talk about profitability. We get asked both of those. We're inundated with questions more on the latter in terms of the overall returns. China versus U.S. Very different business models, very different situations. China has ample power but less compute. The United States is very limited by power but has a massive amount of compute. The American perspective first, and then we'll go to the Chinese perspective. The American perspective is the big five U.S. labs are going to take about 10 times the compute that they had last time to train their next model. And if scaling laws hold, when you apply 10 times the compute, the model that comes out should be about twice as capable. So what that means in very tangible terms is first quarter, second quarter of 2026, those American models could achieve breakout performance that others cannot keep up with because of that compute. We believe other competitors around the world just don't have that computational power. So that is the American point of view. It's we will get much better. That results in lower unit costs of being able to perform tasks throughout the economy. Now, let's go to the Chinese perspective, which I think is a very powerful argument. The Chinese argument is we don't need to be at the frontier. We can spend less capital and create very useful AI tools at much lower costs, very practical tools. They'll be used around the world. I actually think there is room for both models to coexist. I do think China will be able to secure contracts with customers around the world, but these American models could achieve breakthroughs that can essentially result in more parts of the economy being addressable by AI than people realize. Okay, I hear you there, uh, but uh, how do you bridge the power deficit, right, to get to that kind of, or support that kind of compute in the U.S.? Because uh, latest statistics I've seen, China generates enough electricity or power, right? They, they outpower the U.S., I think, two to one. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in the U.S., let's walk through that issue. So we have this detailed chip-based power model. In the U.S., we would need to build about 70 gigawatts of power between now and 2028. To put that in context, New York City is around 6 gigawatts. So 70 is a massive number. Traditional solutions won't be enough. We will be short about 45 gigawatts uh, after we consider those traditional solutions. That said, where there's a will and lots of money, there's often a way. And so, for example, gas turbine complexes, fuel cell complexes, converting Bitcoin sites into data centers, all of these would be used. And if we're aggressive in those, we might be able to be very close to bridging the gap. But I do think we're going to be short. And so that means not every data center that once you get built will be able to get built in time in the U.S. So part of the solution or answer uh, has got to be nuclear, right? Yes. And small uh, modular reactors, SMRs, right? Yes. Uh, you talked about the will being there and the money being there as well. What about the laws and the regs? Are they changing fast enough to support nuclear rebuilding? Yeah, great question. Team Trump is very supportive of nuclear. You see that almost every day. They provide a variety of nuclear support. And we will see SMR development in the United States, and that's a good thing. It's zero carbon, it's controllable, it's highly reliable. The challenge, the last challenge that we're thinking about is cost overrun protection. So I've lived in the power sector through 30 years of ups and downs, and we have seen new nuclear projects in the United States and many parts of the world be vastly over budget and behind schedule. So the sector very much wants protection against those cost and schedule overruns. We don't yet have that in the United States. That may require legislation. We're not sure we have the, the willpower in the U.S. for that. So that is, that is, a, that is an issue. Okay. So that's a nice segue to uh, the other big theme that you've been thinking, writing, and uh, talking about as well, and that is the rebuilding of defense industrial bases around the world. Let's start right. with the U.S. where it's, it's pretty obvious, it's pretty apparent, uh, right? Yes. And this whole issue of the cost plus business model uh, with regard to the defense primes uh, has been 
Well, to be put as diplomatically, I think a very, very an efficient way of deploying capital and using, obviously, at the end of the day, taxpayer money, right? How close are we to that being changed or upended by names like uh, like Andrew, which is still private? It's a great question. So the U.S. War Department is thinking a lot about the evolution of warfare. Just last week, there was a list of six new technologies that the U.S. War Department wants to adapt. And this does deal, to your point, with asymmetric warfare with very low cost approaches to, uh, to weapon systems that can cause a great deal of damage with very little capital expenditures. So I do think the U.S. War Department is thinking about this. That creates all kinds of implications. So perhaps concentrated, extremely expensive pieces of uh, defense equipment may really be de-emphasized in favor of massively distributed capabilities. I, I would expect to see that. That does put pressure, to your point, on Unicost. That does put a lot of pressure on that. Uh, the U.S. needs to adapt. A Reminds me of other technologies, though, where other parts of the world come up with better, lower cost approaches. The U.S. needs to adapt. I do see Team Trump uh, realizing that and taking steps to adapt. Okay. You know, we've been talking a lot about uh, valuation and the AI trade, whether uh, things are overstretched, right? And uh, I mentioned uh, NVIDIA uh, post this set of earnings that's probably actually below 30 times. Yeah. Palantir at one stage not so long ago was about 200x. Now it's maybe about 175, 180 or so. Uh, is, is, is that an issue or not? Or, or is Palantir almost a singular sort of company? It's a great question. When we, ask, we get asked about the bubble, the concept that we yeah. just don't have sufficient returns, I think it varies a lot by the business model. But let me start with a fundamentally bullish argument. When we look at the use cases for AI, we did this detailed assessment of the S&P 500, where we went job by job, and looked at what AI can do, and we found that we could save about $900 billion in costs within the United States, within the S&P 500. That is absolutely dramatic from where the technology is today. And I think what investors are really missing is, it doesn't matter where the technology is today, it matters where it's going in three, six months. And that improvement rate is nonlinear and very important. So I like that overall case. Now that doesn't mean that every stock, therefore, is a buy across the entire value chain. What I like, I guess I come from infrastructure, it's no surprise, but I like the bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. Anybody who has compute, who has power, who has labor, who can de-bottleneck the power system to get more compute, that's going to be very valuable. The adopters are going to be very valuable, and investors have barely scratched the surface on AI adoption and the benefits, so I like that quite a bit. But some business models are riskier. Frontier model development is a much riskier business. So I'm not suggesting every company is a buy as a result of AI being so strong. I think it's more nuanced. You know, Stephen, the way you're talking about it, it sounds as though uh, both themes that we've uh, started talking about, uh, AI and power, and also uh, building back the defense industrial base around the world, right? Uh, they're actually not uh, separate and singular silos, right? They're actually <laughs> interrelated uh, through technology. Absolutely. A good example would be rare earths and chips. Uh, so it's very clear that this question will continue to come up. China has significant leverage when it comes to rare earths. We know that. The United States have a le has a leading position in terms of access to the cutting edge AI technology. How will that evolve? So one question that comes up a lot is, if the American labs advance next year beyond their Chinese counterparts, how does that impact broader trade policy? How does that impact access to rare earths? Rare earths are very important to the U.S. War Department. So you're absolutely right. It is linked. There is this mutual dependency between the two nations, a mutual vulnerability, uh, which actually makes me optimistic in the sense when you have situations like that, you can find equilibrium given that both nations have dependencies on each other.